Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, April 3rd, 2014. Now, by now, I'm sure you've heard about the unfortunate shooting at Fort Hood. Four people killed, 16 wounded at this point. We had reporters from InfoWars go up there, Kit Daniels and Jakari Jackson, and they asked the questions that the mainstream media has been avoiding. Specifically, were they, was the shooter on SSRI drugs? That has been the common link in all of these mass shootings. It's not PTSD, as the mainstream media is making this out, as they're trying to demonize the soldiers with this, but it is SSRI drugs. Now, Kit Daniels also asked the general who was fielding questions about the response time. The general said they were very happy with the response time. It took 10 to 15 minutes to get there. Well, that's about two people a minute getting shot because the soldiers are not allowed to carry weapons. But that doesn't keep people like Piers Morgan from demonizing guns and demonizing that being carried. In a report from Paul Joseph Watson, Fort Hood shooting, is it time to disarm the entire U.S. military? And the Twitter verse goes to war with Piers Morgan's ridiculous assertions. Piers Morgan says, if only there'd been a good guy with a gun. And a person replied, such crap. And then Piers Morgan says the soldier shooter was a good guy until he turned bad with a gun. To which Katie Pavlich said, should we stop giving soldiers guns? Oh, wait, already did that. Result, mass shootings and gun-free defenseless military bases. Exactly. Take a look at these pictures from the Daily Mail. We've got the shooter here holding looks like a 50 caliber gun. And underneath the caption says that he was on Ambien. And then we see even a picture of him with a rocket launcher. And by the way, he was not in battle. It doesn't appear that PTSD was the problem. But Piers Morgan's whole line is essentially the same as we see at the airports, where the TSA hassles airline pilots who are flying the planes and taking away nail clippers from them. That's what they're doing in the military bases. If we can't trust these guys with weapons, why are they in the military in the first place? And of course, the police and the military police that are there at the base they're in the same boat. Most of the police are former military themselves. But it really is coming down to things like the equalizer. It was one woman who stopped the shooter, one woman with a gun. That is the thing that equalizes them. But as I was driving to work this morning, I heard local radio talking about this because this is not only in this area, it's not just a national story, but it's also a story with a lot of local concern. The military's base is only a couple hours away from here. I heard talk radio hosts saying, that military base is filled with crazy people. To which the other host, who's supposedly more conservative, said, well, I wouldn't use that term. It's not politically correct to say that. We need to come up with something. He didn't disagree that the problem was the soldiers. The problem is not the soldiers. Again, the problem is SSRI drugs and a situation where only a single shooter in a gun-free zone has a free hand to do whatever they wish. But we need to remember, as many people, many conservatives are blaming PTSD and mental illness and pushing gun control on those people, we need to understand how that has traditionally been misused and how our veterans have been abused in the past. Take a look at this series from December. This was something that was reported on in detail by the Wall Street Journal, PBS and others picked up on it. It hit across the left-right political spectrum. The forgotten lobotomies of World War II vets Turns out that lobotomies were reportedly used in VA hospitals as finer, final answers for uh, if other treatments didn't work in World War II. First, they would try things like alternating high-pressure blasts of cold and hot water, then insulin-induced comas, then electric shock therapy. If those were deemed ineffective, they used lobotomies on more than 2,000 soldiers, many of them who had suffered horrifically in World War II in Japanese prisoner of war camps. And because of that suffering, what they did was they doubled down on it when these soldiers came back, leaving them in a state that they described as overgrown children, unable to care for themselves. Seizures, amnesia, motor function loss, even death were common outcomes. This is the way we have treated our veterans in the past. And if you think it's going to be any better, take a look at this new brain initiative that is coming from DARPA and other Components in the U.S. government. Now, President Obama has doubled the funding for the BRAIN Initiative, and the BRAIN Initiative is actually an acronym. 
Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. And this is being focused by DARPA, and they're saying that they're going to help people with PTSD. That's one of the ways that they are well, selling this is to, as a cure for PTSD, that they're going to be able to selectively remove memories. Do we really want the government that has been invading our homes, invading our privacy, invading our emails, our metadata, do we really want them to now be able to invade our minds? The new technologies are much more subtle, much more high tech than the old style lobotomies or electric shock. But it is the same sort of thing that has always traditionally been used against dissonance. In the Soviet Union, if the government didn't like you, they declared you insane and took you away. That is what's coming if we start to support gun control in the name of looking out for all those crazy people on military bases. No, people are not disqualified from living in our society just because they served in the military and were subject to extremely abusive treatment as a result of that. Now, there's also, of course, the gun side of this, and we see this illustrated here again in San Antonio. It wasn't that long ago that Open Carry Texas had a large rally in San Antonio because people were being harassed for legally, openly carrying guns, protected under state law, even protected under the Second Amendment, we could argue. And so InfoWars covered that, and we saw that when there were thousands of gun owners there, the police were very deferential, very respectful. There was no trouble. As soon as it dwindled down to just a few people, they started getting, started harassing people again. And now we see this in San Antonio over the weekend. We see a Texas man who is testing the open carry law. Folks, he's doing civil rights work. This is the way Alex has described it. He's exactly right. This is the modern civil rights movement. He's told he's free to go. Then he's tasered and arrested. This is a very long video, but what happens is a 19-year-old who was carrying a loaded rifle strapped to his back was, had a very long discussion with an officer. He was told by the officer, you're not under arrest, you're free to go, you're just going to happen to walk home and I'm going to happen to make sure you get home safely and as soon as you get home safely, you'll never see us again. Then another police officer shows up. This police officer asks him if the gun is loaded and he says yes. He says, hand it over. He says, not unless I'm legally under arrest, at which point the guy just tasers him, and as the report says, the taser malfunctioned and did not stop after five seconds. I had to manually shut it off, said the officer. There you go. He's just using it as compliance punishment. We've got a conflict between the local city ordinance and the state ordinance, which I would argue that the city ordinance and even the open carry laws that are in place against pistols in Texas are in conflict with the Second Amendment. But... You know, if it's in conflict and you don't lawfully arrest somebody, you can still taser them just for compliance. Now, also in more military news, we see there's more evidence of U.S. funding al-Qaeda terrorists in Syria. You know, last week we saw that the Turkish government was plotting to use al-Qaeda to start false flags. And this story from Kurt Nemo, we see the Washington, Repo Washington Post reporting that back in December, there was an effort to thwart the fear of the public that the U.S. would be supporting radical jihadists. The Secretary of State made a statement that he was certain that only 25% of the rebels were jihadists. <laughs> and Kurt Nemo points out, in other words, in an effort to subvert a sovereign nation and decide who will rule over it and who will cooperate with the financial elite, the U.S. government is only partially collaborating with declared enemies, al-Qaeda. That is, we are assured that that's better than fully cooperating with them. Now, in economic news, we see that the IRS chief has said that Obamacare enforcement is like snow removal. There you go. He says, even as the IRS faces budgetary pressures, the health law will be a priority just as snow removal is for a city. I guess it's a much higher priority than providing emails that show the IRS was part of a political oppression uh, of Obama's political enemies, but it's just like snow removal. Actually, I think that's the first time that they've ad admitted that Obamacare is a real snow job. But it's not just snow that they're shoveling, and they're shoveling it onto the working poor. Look at this story from Michael Snyder. Nine of the 10 occupations in America pay an average wage of less than $35,000 a year. Folks, this is the engineered collapse of the middle class. What he does here is he's got the 10 jobs, the 10 job categories that employ the most number of people in the U.S. economy, and only one of those, nurses, made more than $35,000 a year. 
only one of these job categories. Registered nurses made more than $35,000 a year. Now, the sad thing about this is that Obamacare and the mandates that it puts on employers are causing the people that are in these types of typically service jobs to have their hours cut, many times their entire job cut. They're being cut back to part-time pay because so many businesses will not be able to afford the mandates. These, of course, are also going to be the types of service jobs that are going to be most vulnerable to being replaced by artificial intelligence and robotics. For example, people who are freight and material movers, truck drivers, for example, they are going to be replaced, for the most part, with self-driving cars, and not that many years out. But right now, 59% of all American workers are bringing home less than $35,000 a year. Now, in more police state news, we see that even more people are claiming that they've been targeted for having Colorado license plates. We pointed out that one fellow in Idaho was targeted. That was a story that broke last week. Now we see that in Nevada, a motorist named Mark Jennings says he was stopped more than once by the state police. He was stopped three different times. And he said on one of these stops where it occurred to him this what was going on, he said there were either three or four other state troopers pulled up in other vehicles. And I was in the car watching these other vehicles pull up. At that point, I knew for sure it was probably them thinking that I was transporting drugs from Colorado into another state. That's exactly what these other drivers have pointed out, especially the guy in Idaho. They brought drug-sniffing dogs. This is the kind of profiling that we're concerned about. And of course, in California, we just had a report a couple of weeks ago that the police there said they wanted to get all license data, because, license data in a database because they considered everyone as suspects in a crime. What are you going to do when the government starts mining everybody's behavior trying to discover crimes? This is the danger of the surveillance state, and it's not going to stop there. Look at the way that they're suppressing information. The Ministry of Truth is cracking down on climate change skeptics. This is from The Times in the UK. Ben Webster writes, ministers who question the majority view among scientists about climate change should, quote, shut up and instead repeat the government line on the issue. According to members of parliament, the Commons Science and Technology Committee said that appearance on radio and television by climate skeptics should be accompanied by Health warnings, health warnings. The MPs said that the BBC should apply the same stringent requirements to interviewing climate change skeptics as it applies to interviewing politicians. For example, any proposal to invite politicians to contribute to non-political output must be referred to the chief advisor of politics. This is a sure sign that they are losing the argument. The data does not support global warming. It was supposed to be driven by an increase in CO2. We've seen record increases in CO2, and yet we have seen globally temperatures declining, even though they're moving a lot of collection of temperatures to places that are hot spots, places like cities, places like airports. They're losing the data. That's why they have to suppress the argument. Would they be trying to shut people up and censor them if people were going around saying that the earth was flat? No. But when they're telling the truth about what's going on and pointing to the data, they have to be shut up. Now, Turkey has been shutting down YouTube. They censored YouTube last week. And of course, before that, they shut down Twitter. But the American government is a bit more devious and subtle than that. Instead of shutting down social networks, they're manufacturing fake social networks like this Cuban Twitter account. Leanne McAdoo has that report. The U.S. government created a secret social media platform aimed at taking down Cuba's communist government. With the recent introduction of cell phone use in Cuba, U.S. officials saw the perfect opportunity to reach hundreds of thousands on the island. The plan was to launch a Cuban Twitter using cell phone text messaging to evade Cuba's strict control of information and internet regulation. Initially, users would receive non-controversial content like news messages on soccer games or music and hurricane updates. Later, when the network reached a critical mass of subscribers, operators would introduce political content aimed at inspiring Cubans to organize smart mobs, mass gatherings called at a moment's notice that might trigger a Cuban spring. This was incredibly dangerous for the some 40,000 young Cubans who were interacting with the platform. They had no idea that the messages they thought were uninformed.